I believe in humanity. I believe in people. I believe that we'll all be able to solve these problems. And I believe that the the biggest problems in the, gonna, in the world will be solved by the most unsuspecting characters. Welcome to Crazy Good Turns. I'm your host, Frank Blake. And today we have the honor of having on the podcast two impossibly interesting people. Mick Ebeling, the founder and CEO of Not Impossible Labs, and Daniel Belker, Director of Technology at Not Impossible Labs. I think you're going to really enjoy this episode. Every once in a while, we get to talk with people whose perspectives on life are at one and the same time both so radically different than everyone else's, yet so straightforward and compelling that you just step back in amazement. And that's today. I'll start with a brief description of Mick's background. He ran a very successful commercial and film production company, working on movies like Kite Runner and Quantum of Solace, but then took a crazy good turn in a completely different direction, setting up the Not Impossible Lab that uses technology to solve incredibly difficult problems for others. One of Mick's principles is that the biggest problems in the world will be solved by the most unsuspecting characters. I'll amend that by saying solved by some of the world's most fascinating characters. And so with that, here's our episode. You know, Mick, you have so many incredible stories that it's difficult to know where to start, but I'm going to start with one of your quotes. You said that what is behind Not Impossible Labs is, and here's the quote, the power of letting one human being truly affect your life. So I'd like to start by asking you to take our listeners on a journey into Not Impossible's second mission, the one where you helped a boy named Daniel in the South Sudan. Can you describe for our listeners why you wanted to help him and what happened? Not Impossible... I always feel like it's it's important to ground this the philosophy and the movement of non impossible because we are a business, but we we see ourselves also as having a, a a more grand purpose on this planet of being a movement um, in our mission statement, which is change the world through technology and story. So because we are storytellers and because we are storytellers and artists, um, how we tell our story is very important and equally as important to the crazy technology and technological solutions that we create. So everything will always be grounded in that. As, as Daniel and I walk you through kind of what we're up to, everything will always be grounded in that. And so that's part of that quote is that part of the story that we tell at Not Impossible when we're tackling these absurdities, we don't tackle absurdities by name, malaria, poverty, hunger, because there's a very easy and a default mode for us to go into as human beings where we can say, oh, that's just so big. That's big. so huge. So there's, tough. There's, yeah, so huge. How do, you, how do you encapsulate that, right? But if you say, I'm going to solve it for John or Jane, now all of a sudden— it becomes quantifiable, and you have a, a chance to relate to it emotionally, to to, to relate to it in, in in what it. Maybe you have a brother, maybe you have a daughter, maybe you have a you know you met whatever it might be. Now there's a chance for you to boil that cup as opposed to that ocean. Very early in the the launch of Non Impossible Labs, when we didn't know what we were doing or how we were doing it, but we've really felt a calling to use what we call and technology or to create technology for the sake of humanity. I was out to dinner with a friend of mine, and he said, hey, I know you're, I know you're still trying to figure out this whole non-impossible thing, but you got to check out this doctor uh, that I just read about named Dr. Tom Katana. And so I went home afterwards and researched this guy, and he was a, this incredible doctor who was a naval surgeon who became a missionary doctor, and he was in the, located in the Nuba Mountains, this, this area between Sudan and South Sudan. And he talked about all the different things he had to do, but he talked about the one thing he hated to do was to perform amputations. And mm-hmm. in reading more about him, he talked about this one particular amputation that he had to do because the president of Sudan is constantly bombing the, the, the people of this, in this area around this amputation he had to do for a young boy named Daniel who was out tending his family's goats and cows. And he uh, heard the bombers coming, he didn't know where to go to, didn't know where to hide, uh, hid behind a tree, wrapped his arms around a tree. The bomb went off not far from where he was. 
And because he was behind the tree, he, his body was protected from the blast. But because his arms were wrapped around the tree, the bomb blew off his arms. Oh, my God. That moment, that moment of realization that this young boy, this young 12-year-old boy had forever had his life changed was this, like, kick in the gut. But the fact that what he said afterwards was, if I could die, I would because now I'm going to be such a burden to my family. So the image of this armless boy, the concept that he was that he was now a double amputee and then added to that the fact that his first response was this unselfish response that he wish he doesn't wish he was dead because he's going to, of what was me but because he's going to be a burden to his family. And then because 14, you know, or or I'm sorry, like 40 feet away from me, my 12-year-old boy was asleep and I just like that was that moment of connection where I said oh my god that's I I can't just sit back and just read this story and feel bad or post it on Facebook tomorrow and and have a dialogue about it I have to actually go do something and so that launched Project Daniel and we brought together a team of brilliant people we crafted a solution I flew into this refugee camp and we ended up launching the world's first 3D printing prosthetic lab and created a way not just for Daniel to be able to feed himself for the first time in two years since he had lost both of his arms, but also created a way for this small village to continue to print 3D arms after we left. So, so Mick, you say that all so matter-of-factly rolling through it, but I, wow, just even locating him, getting to South Sudan, getting a team together— just maybe give some of the sense of the, uh, this is not an easy thing to tackle. It's not, and I don't want to play it down, but I think you use the skills that you've been blessed with. And at the time I was a producer, and as a producer, all we do is take on projects that are impossible. Now, (laughs) it was making film titles or telling, you know, making Nike commercials or different things like that. So, the cause wasn't nearly as as meaningful, but you still had to deal with and circumnavigate and dig under and get around these issues and problems that would pose themselves. So when you contextualize it, if I could figure out how to solve problems for a music video or a film title where we got bumps and speed bumps and roadblocks along the way, then solving roadblocks and speed bumps along the way for the end goal, not being a television commercial or a main title, but instead being uh, having it be so a kid could feed himself, it puts things into perspective and you push a little bit harder on trying to figure those things out, which is good because (laughs) they were definitely harder to figure out, being it was across (laughs) the world and dealing with the UN and dealing with refugee camps and dealing with all these things that I had never experienced before. But the reason of us doing it, again, back to that help one, help many principle, if you focus on the one person, we were trying to help Daniel. So we it was come hell or high water, we were going to do anything we could to try to to try to solve the problem and come up with a solution for him. Take us to the moment when you put your invention onto Daniel and it works. What did his face look like? What what did he do first? Imagine, you know, when the sun comes down, you know, like that moment where the sun goes beneath the ocean at sunset. And remember, you know that moment where the sun comes up at sunrise? Yeah. And remember that moment, you know, when you see the rainbow after a rainstorm and maybe your children being born or like all those, put all those into a mixing pot and that's what it was like. It was this just beautiful moment where we were sleep deprived, we were hot, it was like everything was going wrong, but we kind of come hell or high water figured it out. And that moment where we did a test and we we ended up having to hack a solution around our solution that he could actually scoop down and grab a spoonful. I actually, funny enough, it was a, literally a spoonful of sugar. Um, and he grabbed a spoonful of sugar and put it in his mouth and then later grabbed a spoonful of lunch and put it in his mouth. That moment was just... I don't even know how to describe it except for just just beautiful, you know, in its most it doesn't even seem like it does it justice. It right. was just an incredible moment we where we had pulled it off and the hope and the optimism and the and the feeling that he had was just so immense because literally days earlier than that he was 
forlorn and kind of looking back into the corner and not really wanting to to make eye contact. And now all of a sudden, he was he was a kid again, you know, and he he was goofing off and playing with stuff. And and now it, it felt like he'd been almost given or reminded that he had permission to be a kid, and he just started being a kid again. And as amazing as that story is, it's actually that was your second project, right? As not impossible. The, the first was helping a paralyzed graffiti artist draw again using only his eyes, using a device I think you called the eye writer. Where did you even come up with such an idea? Well, most of the stuff that we come up with is crafted by assembling brilliant people together who are given this white, you know, slate to create whatever we need to to solve whatever that problem is. So I convened a bunch of just what we call mad scientists and misfit geniuses from all the corners of the world. They came into my house when my wife and kids and I moved out. We pushed all the tables and chairs against the wall. They slept on floors and couches. And we just hacked and programmed for about two and a half weeks and ended up creating a device that was made of cheap sunglasses, a coat hanger, zip ties, duct tape, and a web camera. We wrote some code. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and we put it on a paralyzed graffiti artist named Tony Tempquan. And by moving his eyes back and forth, that web camera tracked his pupil and essentially act as, you know, the tip of a cursor, if you will, that tracked across the screen. And that allowed him to draw again. And that was only possible because of this collaboration and brain trust of the brilliant people who convened at our house because they believed in the story of this one, of Tempt. You know, if I said, hey, let's craft a solution that allows paralyzed people to be able to draw, that's still a, still very noble, but it's it's not as emo- – it doesn't emotionally resonate Easy to with get someone lost to say, ah, yeah, yeah, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, it would be great to, oh, I'm busy, i got to take the kids to soccer practice, or I'm, my job is taxing me, whatever it might be. It's just so much more meaningful when you say, I'm doing this for Tony, because nobody wants to let another human being down. I, I truly believe that. Nobody wants to let another human being down. And so if everyone says, I'm in, let's do this for tempt, <laughs> and then things get hard, you can't say, well, I'm out of here, you know, bugger this, screw this, I'm gone. Because you're saying that, you're, gonna, you're basically saying no to the person that you said you were going to help. So just to follow up on that, and also I'd like to ask Daniel his perspective on this, but you've said that a great lesson or rule that you've learned from that experience was – Commit and then figure it out. Talk a little bit about what that means for you and how you live it, and then I'd love to hear Daniel's take on it because I assume he's one of those people who gets the note. Let's figure this out. No true words have been said about Daniel, that's for sure. We enter every absurdity that we're solving, every impossibility that we're trying to make not impossible truly with no clue how we're going to solve it and no degrees, diplomas, or credentials that entitle us to actually be able to address the issue. But, I mean, that is part of what's amazing about this. It's not like you come at it with deep engineering background or technological background. No, we, we say that the credentials for someone who's on a not impossible team is our two. You have to breathe air and, and pump blood if you've got those two things. <laughs> and a belief that it can be solved and that you're going to play a role in solving it, then those, those are your credentials. And so, Daniel, how does it, what does it feel like when you get these, here's our absurd task we're tackling? Is your first reaction, well, that's absurd, or are you now... Is everyone conditioned just throw themselves into it? First of all, the, like Mick is such an, an inspiration and a, and a driving force that uh, I, I joke sometimes that he creates like this aura of you know possibilities that you just don't realize uh, such a thing is not a thing. You know, so my personal attitude was uh, I, I felt very aligned, you know, with uh, non impossible uh, concepts and ideas from the start because. I'm naturally inclined uh, to do things people used to say, like, this is doesn't make sense, or this is crazy, or it's too far-fetched. For me, it seemed like a natural movement to, to engage on those uh, challenges. And if you're not afraid to try and make mistakes, so if you have this in your heart, you know, the driving force and the, the will 
to help people, uh, I think things start getting to place, uh, I wouldn't say naturally. It takes a lot of effort and time, but uh, eventually you you come up with uh, solutions that might not be you know, right in the first try or in the second try or in the third try or in the 100th you know, time, but uh, eventually you, you start you know, connecting the pieces together and you might come you might end up with with a solution. And uh, I think that's part of the beauty of it, actually. How having these goals, and as Mick was saying, like driving this towards, uh, you know, a human person and, and actually getting emotionally involved with their struggles and their difficulties and, and wanting to, you know, truly help and make their lives better can make amazing things, right? Well, you are doing some amazing and amazingly inspired things. Maybe this is a good opportunity to talk about your latest project, which, if I understand it, is is called Vibro Textiles, and it's actually about helping the deaf hear. Mick, can you give some of the background of what got you into that, and then maybe we could talk about how the technology works and so on. So we're based in Venice Beach, California, and because of that, you know, we're skateboarding and surfing and and that that's part of our culture right it's just part of what we're around all the time so um a friend of ours fell hit his head and lost his sense of smell so he didn't fall on his nose he lost his sense of smell by falling on the on the back of his head he wasn't wearing a helmet Mm. and that triggered this thing for me this realization of like oh that's interesting so you don't smell with your nose you smell with your brain and that means you don't see with your eyes or taste with your tongue or hear with your ears. You do that all with your brain. And so that was just this interesting observation that I had. Well, that coincided at the same time where I became very obsessed with how the deaf experienced music. I saw some things online that the deaf would go to concerts and they would just stand in front of speakers and just just be essentially be vibrated against by the by the speakers. And to me, that seemed absurd because music is so finite and so precise and so there's so these detailed components of music that now it's all being dumbed down into this just low end, just thud, which is boom, it's boom, being boom, boom, yeah. Boom, boom, yeah? Huh. And I said, well, wait a second. If the deaf, if, if the eardrums are basically just vehicles to the brain, then that means you don't hear with your ears, you hear with your brain. So why don't we just figure out a way to get around the eardrums, the, the parts that aren't working, and get straight to the brain. And I'm not talking about bone conduction. I'm talking about, you know, actually getting straight to the brain in th- you know, through a different channel. So we, you know, started to think about that and, and you know, I said, well, why, don't, why don't we use the skin as the eardrum? Because that can send a signal to the brain and we'll then take the concept of music and break it into its separate parts. So you've got, you know, just say drums, vocals, bass, and guitar. And so we crafted a, a, this theory that we could project music, you know, in its different instruments and its different components to different parts of the skin. And then that would send signals to the brain, right? So drums to the ankles, guitars to the wrist, vocals to the chest, bass to the base of your spine, right? And you, you could do any mix of it, but just use that for example. And so I said, okay, amazing. That, I think that can work. That'd be amazing. Now I got to figure out how we're going to pull this off. And so I started talking to different people that I that I respect and 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 just started brainstorming the idea and talking it and then I got introduced to a guy named Dr. David Petrino, who I had known and had collaborated with us, um, or I didn't get introduced to him, but he had been collaborated with us on Project Daniel, and he was a never-say-die guy. Like, I met him on, a, on the Friday before we started our work on Project Daniel in New York, and two hours after I met him, I had him on a flight flying to L.A. He was like, I'm in, let's do it, Geronimo, right? And so that mentality, that Geronimo, just kind of like, here we go, is, is totally part and parcel of the teams that we build. And so I called him, and we started brainstorming. He's like, hey, I know this, this, this amazing sound designer named Patty Hanlon. And so we got him on the phone, and then he said, oh, I know this 
uh, I'm, I'm sure this is not what he said, but I will say this now. I know this crazy mad scientist, brilliant Brazilian musical genius artist named Daniel Belker. Uh-huh. Uh, we got to we got to get him <laughs> in the works. So that's kind of how the team formed, and we started just experimenting with it and playing with it. And and I would when I they were all based in New York, so when I would get to New York, I would meet up with them and they would show me where we were going. And we were just kind of we were working on it. It wasn't everybody's full time commitment, but it was experimentation. And then we finally got to a point where I had a, I got a meeting. I knew the CEO of uh, Skull Candy, and I was telling him about what we were doing. And he said, "Hey, my guys are going to be in New York if you want to show it to them." And so we set that set up this meeting. And I called Daniel, and Daniel and I were collaborating a lot at this point. And and so he put together this demo where we could bring these guys into the sound st- studio and try this out. At this time, it's all wired, right? There's no, it's not wireless. It's all wired. It's like a Frankenstein looking, you know, torture device, right? And these guys came in, and they were sitting there. And the meeting started, and they, they, it was clear that they showed up because their boss had told them they needed to show up. <laughs> they were very kind about it. Right, they were very right. courteous and kind. But they, they weren't there on their own accord. Yeah. And so we put it on them, and they were kind of doing, you know, I can't do this because we're in podcast land, but they were leaning back in their chairs a bit, you know, not, again, they were very kind yeah. and very professional, but a little loof, and they, so they backed up a little bit. And then Daniel put it on and started walking them through the demo. And Daniel, when Daniel, you, you, if you want, if you want passion, put Daniel and, and music together, and it's just like fireworks, right? So he starts playing the music and these demos that we'd put together, and these guys kind of sat up a little bit in their chairs. And then we did another track, and then they leaned forward a little bit, and we did another track, and they leaned forward even more. And you could tell from their body language that they were like, "Holy cow, this is incredible." And so then they started asking us all these detailed questions and and grilling us. And then the one the one younger guy was like, "So what's your business model on this?" And Daniel and I always joke, <laughs> we were always like, "Got him." That was we like, got him, you know. Like, okay, now they get what the potential of this is. And that was really that's how I met Daniel. And that that was a moment. That was the I would say the kind of first domino to fall. And I must add that forty eight hours later. 48 hours later, Daniel and his new bride were living at my house. They had moved from New York, put all their stuff in storage and suitcases, and they had moved out and they were living, and we had committed 100% to making this a reality. Wow. All right. Well, we got to pause there for a second. And Daniel, you've got to jump in and explain that decision. Because, uh, you know, I was living in New York. I was... uh recently married and uh, I was working at this uh, amazing electronic arts media center in New York called Harvest Works. They've been around since 1977. They have a huge community and they are a place for where you can experiment and try things out and it's a very welcoming community. So I was working there and I was working with Vibrations for a while. I was very interested and as Mick said, music is my life since I was a kid. I worked as a composer, theater director I, as an arranger uh, and technology came actually to support my my artistic endeavors so to speak uh, and then you know I was programming stuff and teaching and doing things uh, with this artistic mindset and then when I heard about this when Patty told me about this project about you know to help the deaf uh, you know have a musical experience through vibrations as I said this is exactly right up my alley so it's going to take me a week and I'm going to figure everything out and, and then we can take it from there. It took me f- <laughs> one year and two months. And yeah, two, 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 <laughs> a little bit longer than a week. Yeah, exactly. A little bit longer, you know. We should get less cockier as we age, but I still have this, you know, <laughs> sometimes naive moments of like, oh, yeah, this is going to be fine. It's not. It takes a lot of work and stuff. But then when we got to this meeting uh at the end, you know, Mick was just like, oh, you have to move to L.A. and let's do it and let's make it happen. I was like, what, <laughs> what, wait. So, uh, so uh, I, I came back home a little, you know, obviously dazzled. But, but for one of those things in life, when synchronicity or God or universe, however you name it, my sublet agreement was about to end, you know, two days later. And I haven't signed the, the new rent agreement yet. I was about to sign the next day. So I said, okay, so we don't sign the rent agreement and we just go, you know, experiment a little bit, you know, live in L.A. and, you know, let's see what happens. 
I can't stress enough the concept that someone would just make that crazy good turn and say, exactly. yeah, sweet, I'm going, I'm packing my bags, I'm coming out, and then live, essentially live at someone's house for nine months. It, it, it's just... And just married. Just married. Yeah, his yeah. wife, Di, is incredible. She's that behind-the-scenes person that's just making it all possible through Daniel, so... That's phenomenal. So two broad questions for each of you. The first is, did you think, you know, earlier in your professional lives, did you think your lives were pointing at the direction where you are now, or is this a surprise? Daniel, you go first. Okay. No, for me, it's a, it's a crazy good turn, as I said. I basically... You know, went with the flow, basically, and see wherever it would take me. Uh, but having, like, some assurance that, you know, at the bottom of my heart and my convictions were uh, wherever it would take me, it would be fine because I was completely aligned, you know, with my conscience and what I think it was the right thing to do. And uh, so there was always this drive moving forward. And Mick? You know, I... I believe in that saying that the harder you work, the luckier you get. <laughs> and Daniel and I and the team at Not Impossible, we we grind. Like, we work really, really, really hard. I think that because of that and because we stay focused on our values and our ideals and, and the objective of what we're trying to accomplish, these great things keep happening to us. And... I don't necessarily, it's funny, I would have told you, you know, the younger me would have said that, you know, you work hard and you chart your course. And now I would say you work hard and you let your course be charted, but you stay, you kind of keep your own ideological compass, but the rudder, if you will is I think you have to let go a little bit and let let life happen. And I think that every time that you do that, I think the most amazing things happen when you just put yourself in the right, you know, pointing in the right direction, but the exact path you take, you, you kind of leave open to, you know, your your hard work and you're putting your exposing yourself and being vulnerable and and trying and failing. Like that's just all part of the process. And this is coming from a guy who I used to, you know, every January 1st would set these explicit goals. Oh, I love it. Like, I love it. So, yeah. so explicit. And I don't do that anymore. And it's funny because my wife and I have debated, like, that's a, that's a skill set, you know, Zig Ziglar and all these incredible people that we used to listen to growing up and, you know, from our parents talk about goal setting and how important that is. And I still truly believe that. But I think at a certain point that that is, that's almost like a, a training to get to the point where you can... You can then let life and let the universe or whatever you want to call it, without saying too ooga booga on the whole thing, you just have to let that happen <laughs> and evolve, but never take your foot off the gas. You know, like you have to, you have to constantly be pushing in that direction. So I believe that life and, and destiny and your purpose is a mix of letting it happen and at the same time pointing in the right direction. I'm dying to ask just given the difficulty of the problems that you tackle, are there things that you do, practices that you have that keep you, as you said, at the grind, centered on solving it and not giving up? Is there something that is intentional that you feel that allows you to keep doing that? I mean, I would ask this as a question to Daniel. As just, let's do a little role playing. So say I'm having a conversation with Daniel and I said, hey, Daniel, you know, we wanted to help the deaf experience music and have this new experience of music. It's getting really hard. You know, what do you think about just just calling it quits? Or, hey, Daniel, you know, we promised Mandy that we were going to help and create a new way for her to experience music. Should we and call Mandy her and is, Mandy is one of the deaf people you're helping? Yeah, Mandy yeah. Harvey. Like, look, look her up if you're listening right now. Okay. One of the most incredible vocalists, not incredible, most incredible deaf vocalists, incredible vocalist you'll ever yeah. hear. She's amazing. But if I said, okay, Daniel, do you want to, you know, just let's call Mandy and tell her like we're we're, we're going to punch out of this thing. It's too hard. It's too expensive. It's too. It's just. There's too many other things going on. We can't do it. Daniel, what's? It? <laughs> it's like I I know Daniel well enough, but. It, it would what what's an easier question to say yes to 
you know, like, yes, let's quit. Is it easy to say, yes, let's quit to the big picture or easy, like, you know, the concept or easier to say, yes, yeah, let's quit on Mandy. That is such a brilliant way of phrasing it. You know, so yeah. no one wants to, no one wants to pick up the phone and call Mandy. No, I'm not. Call, <laughs> Daniel's not. I'm not. Right. You know? <laughs> right. That's phenomenal. Is there a cue of these impossible problems that you see building behind you that you're itching to get at, or do they truly just come up as the occasion arises? There's two channels, or I guess two pathways. There's the things that we see that are that come to us. You know, people reach out to us or talk to us or we're exposed to. And that's one pathway into these absurdities that we want to solve. And But we've also realized that we are finite humans and we can only absorb and be exposed to as much as we can be absorbed and, and exposed to. So we started to crowdsource absurdities and started to ask other people what's absurd and what should be solved. And we asked the question, what's absurd? And then we ask, who is your one? Because if someone just says, we should end poverty, then, wow. then th- that, one, that one doesn't right. get considered. But if we say, hey, let's solve this problem for this person, then we get a chance to that and then help one help many you know, lens. We look through it and we say, all right, that actually has the potential to help many, many people. Let's solve it for one. So we, we take outside uh, you know, input. We take inside input. And, and back to the answer that we just said, we also are very open to things just dropping in our lap. And we go, holy cow, this is something that, we're, that we were meant to address. Wow. That's, that's amazing. So if if our listeners want to learn more about you, I know you've written a book, you have a podcast, you have a website. What are some of the things they ought to be looking at to learn more about Not Impossible Labs? Well, if you want to learn more about uh, Not Impossible Labs, you can go to notimpossible.com. If you want to learn more about the uh, Music Not Impossible project that Daniel and Patty and David and I have been working on now for for ever so long. You can listen to a podcast that we did that has a whole a whole bunch of of different things that we talk about, but there's a um, an episode called Feel the Music and you'll hear Daniel having conversations and an amazing deaf percussionist named Evelyn Glennie. So that's an amazing way to learn more about Music Not Impossible. You can also see um, if you go, we have a partnership with a company called Avnet and we did a big event with them on September 2018 with this inc- the band that won Best Rock Album at the Grammys called Greta Van Fleet. And so you can see this, essentially the first massive unveiling of the Music Not Impossible technology that, that Daniel has been working on so tirelessly for the last five years, unveiled through an incredible band and with an incredible partner, Avnet. We partnered with um, Jason Flom and Church of Rock and Roll, with Zappos, um, just this incredible group of people that came together to make this a reality. So that's that you can see some footage from that as well. Well, thank you, and, and thank you, Daniel, as well. Thank you, Mick and Daniel, for spending the time. This is, um, it could go on and on. This is such a, f- what you're doing is so fantastic. I, I want to end with just the description that I've read. I hope this is accurate, Mick, and then I might, I'll ask you to comment on it. Your description of yourself as a storyteller and a hacker and a maker which to me is, if we all could get a description like that for our lives, that would be a huge success. How, is that an accurate representation of how you see yourself? Yeah, I think it's pretty accurate. <laughs> I think, I think, good. I think uh, also just a believer. I just believe oh, that, that everything, I believe in humanity, I believe in people, I believe that we'll all be able to, to solve these problems, and I believe that the, the, the biggest problems in the, gonna, in the world will be solved by the most unsuspecting characters you know if you if you met daniel at a bar right now and asked him you know oh so what do you do daniel how how would you answer i work with humanitarian technology and then people like ah but they don't understand so i have basically to explain a lot of stuff you know (laughs) which is funny but uh I, it's really hard, you know. I, I think we're living on a time where we are kind of exploding boxes, you know, and, and going towards different directions. Professionals are uh, going out of, you know, specific fields and reaching other areas as well, you know. 
Uh, and I think that's all very exciting and actually has a lot of potential to, you know, create the solutions uh, for specific uh, human problems, right? And it's all about collaboration and vision. And this is what Mix brings to the table. And, and uh, I think this is uh, amazing, very inspiring for everybody, for me included. The world's problems are going to be solved by dreamers, you know? And I think if you... If you can believe you do it and then you put the hard work into doing it, I think that's the recipe. I can't thank you enough for sharing your insights and the incredible things you are doing for real people. It's truly, truly inspiring. So thank you very much, Mick. Thank you, Daniel. And I hope all of our listeners take time and learn more about both of you personally and your organizations. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much for having us. That was Mick Ebeling and Daniel Belker from Not Impossible Labs. Nick and Daniel also asked me to highlight Big Ben Belker, an important member of their team. So thank you, Big Ben. Find out more about Not Impossible Labs, please go to their website, www.notimpossible.com. As we're finalizing this podcast, Not Impossible is hosting in a couple of days a Not Impossible Awards ceremony in Los Angeles. They'll be celebrating people who are creating technology for the sake of humanity. I hope those awards become an annual event and look forward to talking about them in the future. Our show is recorded at Listen Up Studios in Atlanta, editing by Stephen Key and mixing by Score Score in L.A. Special thanks to our production team of Brian Sabin and Megan Hanlon. Until next time, this is Frank Blake thanking you for listening and celebrating another crazy good turn.